Good evening, everybody. Hopefully this doesn't turn into some kind of Blair Witch project. I'm not pranking you. I swear, whatever goes out there goes. It is currently 12.30 a.m. here. We are now on site. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content and support us at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cryptid Clues. I'm your host, Ruben Olson, joined by your other also host, Taylor Field. Today is going to be a super organic episode as we recount our recent trip in our attempt to go squatching. I know I had nothing clever to say that time, but I mean, I'm super excited just about the content of this episode in general. It's going to be amazing. Taylor, what are your thoughts going into this? Well, we 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 listened to the listeners. We got comments saying, go boots on the ground. And so to have done that and to be in the situation where we can talk about it, it's Boots it's on the ground delightful. much was more like uh, wheels on the ground for us for most <laughs> of it. <laughs> it's yeah. a little too it yeah. was a little too spooky. There's a there's a few things in retrospect I'm excited to talk to you about that like maybe we would have done differently. Maybe we would, you know, maybe on a round two trip eventually here we would try that instead of missing the chance to do it on the first trip. And again, I digress. We'll get into it, but I'm just excited to talk about it. No, absolutely. So uh, this goes back to. Uh, do you mind? Do you mind if I start, Taylor? No, go. I'm, go just, ex- for I'm it. just excited to start. So this goes back to April 23rd, and our original plans were to go out to Nacusp, and we were going to do a day trip, and we we're going to be out there during the daytime. I had booked a day off from work for it, and all that good stuff. It was on a Sunday, so I had booked the Sunday off. And then Taylor sends me a message and he's like, well, you know what? You had that one experience, like a sound, like a whoop over at at Sugar Lake, which is a lot closer to us. Still quite out there. And then Taylor says to me, why don't we go at night? And immediately I'm thinking, oh, like, I mean, I booked off the Sunday. I don't want to have to go and then come home and maybe sleep for an hour and go to work. And he's like, we're going at like midnight the the day before technically the day of because you know midnights are super funky when you think about today and tomorrow concepts so this was technically bright and early 12 o'clock midnight sunday morning just as it rolled from saturday to sunday i had got home from work the saturday evening i ran to bed and i was a little bit too excited maybe a little too spooked i did get some last minute gear And I was trying to sleep. I was trying so hard to go to sleep. And I couldn't do it. About 11 o'clock, I had set my alarm for 11.30 so I could wake up, have a quick shower, and then go. 11 o'clock, my mind finally gave in. I closed my eyes. The wonderful comfort of sleep hit me. And just as my brain finally blanked out, I was ripped back to reality by my alarm clock. So with a half hour of sleep, I had a sip of caffeine, like a rope stringing me along into the shower, got myself wet, figured I was clean enough, got my squatching gear on, which was just hiking gear, really. Got outside, middle of the night, Megan comes out and takes pictures of me in case I get lost. She has something to send to the police. I look like a weirdo. (laughs) Quick, I'm sitting, quick question was yeah. she already awake or did she wake up with you oh no she stayed awake she oh, couldn't wow. sleep so anyways took pictures of me just in case i went missing or something like that and taylor's jeep comes down the driveway lights flashing ready to go i don't know how this man is awake and i hop in and in the moment I'm no longer tired. I'm excited to see Taylor, my buddy. We're going to go do some squatching. And we start driving out towards Sugar Lake, which is 133 kilometers northeast from Kelowna. It's a little campsite 
or at least it used to be. I used to go fishing there as a kid. Uh, further north from that, you can find Monashi National Park. Beyond that, there's some deep, thick wilderness that covers several mountains as you eventually go up from the wilderness into Revelstoke again. So this is kind of east of where we live out in the bush. Now, that trip down the highway before we actually hit the back roads, I was already getting spooked because it was it was nighttime. It was dark. Taylor was a little bit too energetic. He let me take control with the music and I was playing some some tunes. Taylor, how did you how did you feel going into this? What was your intro experience before we got into the bush? Oh gosh. Um so there's a lot of there's a lot of fear, and I'm just gonna say it out now. Uh like Bigfoot is one thing, and I was trying not to think of other cryptids. And then you mentioned Dog Man, and I was like, oh, no. Uh, <laughs> of course I had to mention that. I had so much fun just poking and prodding at your fears. <laughs> well, there, there is a lot of pre-existing fear that is involved with this. Like, when it does get dark and you're out in the woods, I, I do get a little bit more on the cautionary side. I love going out hiking. love going out in trails. But at, at this point in time, like, I, had, I did have a lot of energy. I was, I, I had a busy day. Uh, and I was okay thinking, let's try to gather our thoughts, get the gear ready, everything like that. So I didn't get to bed till probably 1030, maybe around there. But I, I didn't get feel like a full hour's worth of sleep. And I set my alarm for 1130. I loaded up the vehicle, supplies, all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, I had to head out to you. And you're about a, an hour away, I'd say, 40 minutes probably. Um Oh, you got here. You got here in time. I got there in time. Yeah, it was after 12, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so about probably like 1230 or something like that. But It was like 1210. Was it really? Oh, gosh. So getting there, getting connecting with you, and yeah, we loaded up your stuff, got your fishing gear, all that kind of stuff. So that's when it really set in, like, wow, we we're really doing this. Uh, at, I've never, <laughs> that was I've my never thoughts. You were the one doing the driving. I was like, yeah. "Oh yeah, we're really doing this. Holy really crap, he's this. here!" Yeah, uh. <laughs> and I've I've never I've never I've never done anything remotely like this. I've gone camping and everything like that, but it, 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 within certain reason, I've never intentionally gone out with the mindset and the notion of actually, you know, achieving this like <laughs> with this goal in mind. And I'll be honest, I, I was trying to poke at your fear a little bit, but I, once we did get to the bush, that's I think where we both kind of stopped teasing each other. When, mm -hmm. we were, when we were in the reality of it, it was like, okay, brothers in arms, here we go. We got to be serious about this. If there's a spook, we're not, I don't want to be like scared right here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And it's it's not something that, uh, like, I wasn't expecting like five minutes in, we're going to see anything or encounter anything. But once, yeah, you're absolutely right. Once we got there, that's when it really set in. And it was a lengthy drive. It was like an hour and a half probably to get out there. Mm -hmm. Got there probably around yeah, one to two-ish around that time frame. And it, it the one thing that blows my mind is driving through there at night was one thing. But then coming back when we had daylight and seeing everything that we actually missed, how many open areas there were, how many different spots. It's like, wow, this is actually really insane. And yeah. just for you uh, listeners, like we were remote. There was not, we didn't see a single soul out there until we were leaving and we were pretty much back on the actual main road and there was a truck that came because we stopped here and do some fishing and this truck came, stopped, and then you turned and got out of there. But other than that, there's nobody. Yeah, I, I think we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves here. So backtracking here, um, when we got to the off-roading bit, like you drive out down the highway a little bit and you take some turns and you go off the road there's still some proper roads, some named roads and stuff. And then you get to logging road out towards Sugar Lake. You just have some little markers here and there. And as soon as you turn off into that, you lose cell service like it's gone. Like there's some little lakes up here closer to home where once you're on the lake, you lose your cell service. Or once you're like parking your car at the lake, you lose your cell service. But the whole drive up, you have like a bar or two, maybe it flickers here and there, but no, like a good 30, 40% of the way to our destination, cell service is gone, disappears completely, which is a little terrifying if you think, well, okay, if something goes wrong, I don't have, I have an iPhone 13, I don't have the 14 with the satellite connection, so I can't 
I can't do an SOS call or anything like that. Like we're actually out here and we're stuck if something happens. We're walking all the way back to cell service in the middle of the night. And we get out there and it is pitch black, canopy of trees over you, just like little wooden tunnels that you just go through. And it gets dark really quick, which for me, I was awake for the trip out to the bush. And as soon as we kind of got to the old logging road, I was starting to feel the tether of sleep trying to pull me back in. And I was like, oh, no, I don't want to close my eyes. Okay, got to keep my eyes open. And I can't remember at which point, maybe it was marker one or marker two, we pulled out our flashlights. We had a brilliant idea. We thought, you know, we're going to be driving for quite some time. Pull out our flashlights, roll down the window so there's no glare, which was spooky because then you could hear the outside. You could hear how silent it was. And we're just going to shine our lights off into the open areas. And that first time that I shone my lights, I was like, I better not see anything. I really (laughs) hope I don't like this is my ideal encounter. If I was to see a Bigfoot, I don't want to be standing there. I want to be inside a method of retreat like a vehicle. I want to see it cross the road ahead of me. I want to I want to be able to get away. Or I want to be able to be in an enclosed position where it walks by. Maybe it doesn't know I'm there. It probably does, all things considered. But maybe I can trick myself into pretending it doesn't know I'm there. And it leaves. I see it leave and I'm safe. So being in the Jeep was comforting in a sense. Shining my light out, though, as soon as I put my hand out the window, it was like, well, what if something grabs me? Like I had that unrational, this that fear. That something would just, you know, grab me right in the arm take away my light my only my only hope and taylor had his light as well which was similar in power to mine we had some pretty big flashlights with us and we kind of took turns we were just driving along every time there's a little opening or something we'd shine our light whenever there's like a river or some water you could hear the water flowing as you're driving shine our light whenever we cross like a little wooden bridge shine our light a lot of it was uh, in the openings you could just see swamp or like clearings where some trees were cut down and stuff like that but not a single sign of a human being, nothing that's been up there for some time. And we decided at a certain point, I can't remember exactly which marker it was, but we decided to start keeping track of where we were. And we noted down some points to return to. Sorry, Taylor, I'll let you, I'll let you take over on that. I've been talking for some time. No, no, all good. Uh, I, I, Yes, I have the markers noted in some of our video logs that we recorded. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but I know we got to around the 30 marker, which again, that's around 30 clicks just off the main road. So it in comparison to what you said, yes, we got out there, we were driving, we were alternating like flashlights at times. So one of us watches the road, the other person shines their lights when there's a flat area. And you're right. That definitely got really real, really fast because the windows are down. You're shining your light out there and people listening, you could be thinking right now, oh, these guys do all these cowards, all these wimps going out there. He's just afraid to get out there and get their boots wet, boots on the ground. But um, like I, I don't I don't do that. This kind of stuff all the time. I sit here. I do a lot of research from what research I can source from and inquire, investigate. I try to talk to people, engage with people and then try to form my own opinion. And other than that, like I, I, I hike and stuff like that. But like, for what I'm trying to get at is like it's not the norm for me. So to put myself in an environment that is completely upside down from what I am used to and I live by, it definitely do, it does create that sense of fear and that pre-existing panic that I was experiencing there, even though there's nothing to be worried about. We were safe. We're in a moving vehicle. We had lights. We had food. We were we were you know hiking gear. Like we were totally fine. But that still was there and present. You went to defending yourself really quick because we did eventually get out of the vehicle, but um, I had some snacks and unfortunately they were chocolate and unfortunately I put them at my feet and unfortunately Taylor had the heat on coming up from the floor of the Jeep. So a lot of that stuff melted real quick. It was still tasty though. But yeah, there was a certain point where I'm like, I'm starting to fall asleep. I'm going to eat the granola bar, chocolate chips. It was all mushy. Woke me back up for a little bit as my digestive system kept rolling. Um, and then we found a point where I just can't remember who brought it up, but I was like, hey, like we should like, you know, do some, we should do some uh, like wind knocks. I love finding Bigfoot, something like that, you know, do some calls. Yeah. And I think it was when we drove by the kind of like the little logging area where a whole bunch of wood was piled. 
I think that was our first note where I was like, oh, we should do this. We didn't actually do it yet. But I think that's where I first brought it up. And then we kept going. We found a couple more spots. And when we got up to those, I think you said marker 30, right? When we got up there, Taylor was like, okay, well, let's, let's turn back around. And right away, I thought, well, we're up here. This is as far out as we can get. If we're going to head back, I don't want to do, I don't want to head halfway back and then do a wood knock. I want to do, I want to do some knocks, some calls way out here, like as far as deep as we can go. If there's going to be something, if we're going to get a response, if there's going to be any action at all, it's going to happen the furthest possible distance we can be away from civilization. And there was a couple of good trees, but Taylor was like, well, we got to find a better spot. So we, we didn't drive. And then we went from like marker 30 to 29, like somewhere in between there. Like it was, we didn't drive too far. And Taylor pulled over and we went to the side of the road, got a couple of sticks. And uh, th was it you that did the first knock? I did the first one. Yeah, we had to cut. Uh, we pulled out the hatchet and like there were no proper six rounds. So we just like hacked off this little piece of limb tree <laughs> or dead branch. And it was kind of scary, too, because all we had for light was the headlights of the Jeep. And, of course, walking away from the Jeep in the dead of night out in an old teeny tiny pothole filled logging road, it's complete silence. Like you you could kind of hear maybe a couple of birds up in the trees, some some kind of night birds. Occasionally, and then that was it. That was it for sound. There was no wind. There was no sound of air. There was the rustling of tree leaves through what little wind there was occasionally. So Taylor hits that first log with his hatchet and you hear that loud thunk of the hatchet just echoing. And that was spooky and enough. like that, that, that itself was scary. So we get, we get a good stick. Taylor does a couple of wax. And I'm thinking, okay, I should, I, I should grab my emergency whistle. Uh, like, like a scared little wimp, I should go grab my emergency whistle in case something comes for us that I can at least like call. I don't know if anyone will hear it, but at least I can call. And after a few seconds, we did like a hurried little walk back to the Jeep, sat down with the windows all the way down, and we turned off the lights. I don't know why you did that. But you turned off the lights. Well, wanted to, I guess, like really kind of like go go dark, right? turn everything off because you don't know if these things can necessarily like might be more apprehensive if the thing is running they hear the engine but at least if it's turned off and they get curious they might think oh maybe whatever is there is gone let's go check it out but that's when it got real yeah that was yeah a complete and utter silence and as soon as the lights of the jeep go off you realize you're so far out there that the moonlight doesn't even reach you. Like the, the thickness of the trees, the canopy around the logging road, it was absolute blackness. After giving some time for my eyes to absorb what little tiny bits of light there was, I could maybe make out a, a different shade of potentially where the road was around the bend. And that was it. So it really heightens your senses too, where you're, you're now hearing everything, the teeniest tiniest little snap of a stick and yeah. there really wasn't much it was utter silence yeah which i think just made it even creepier well you you said it's spot on with your senses trying to adapt to the darkness there was a few moments in there where i genuinely thought that i was i was seeing something because i was where the jeep was uh we're pulled off to the left side and I had this kind of like descending arc, I guess you could say, on my left. And then your side was a little more of the road. And then I think it wasn't it more like open area with like a lot of bush, like bushes or not bushes, but like it was Over more like, right. yeah, more open. But there was lots of trees and stuff still still there. So. Yeah, it sloped up pretty steep, but it, it was kind of an open little patch. And then it was thick wood again, like up, right. up the slope. Right. And then to our left, it was like a drop off off the road, but the trees were taller than the road was and hung yeah. over us. They were, yeah. And that's when I had my eyes start to play tricks on me because I, it's complete silence. We turn on, I turn on my phone. I'm trying to listen to anything. And at this point in time, I have gone back and listened. I cranked the audio from these recordings to go through and I went second by second. Now, there are certain... I'm not saying like anything crazy, but there are certain things where you could hear like the faintest little like, huh, 
That's interesting. Could be an animal. Could be wind. Whatever. But really? that, I'd love to. I'd love to listen back those because uh, I know you were recording like your little video logs and stuff of what we were doing. But I wasn't sure if you recorded all the way through, like when I started doing my squatch calls. I did. I got about fifteen minutes from there, and then our next stop that we did, which we'll talk about after, I got about twelve minutes there of just the dead air, oh. just so we could. I could. You could go through and play back and listen to anything. And I mean, maybe you, if you scrub through it, you might catch something that I missed. But yeah. So from when we're stopped here, I listened through. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but. Sitting there, I thought I was seeing something down this uh, drop off, and that's when I felt my heart actually rise up. Um, of course, there's nothing there. I, I very much reluctantly turned my light on because I was like, "Oh shit! If I see something, I will panic, and I'm I don't know how I'm gonna react because am I gonna look to you and like?" Like what am I gonna do? <laughs> I need Switch seats I need with you me to so look. I can drive. <laughs> well, yeah, I need I need you to look. I can't just turn on the engine and drive out of there without you seeing. I, I if I see something, I need to get you to look at it too. Well, when we were driving up there too, there was a certain point where we decided on like like not like a code word, but like a little sound just to make mm-hmm. us look. Like, hey, I see something, and I think it was just like a shh. Yeah, just a, just a quick shh sound, and you and I both kind of agreed that's what we do, and I think. At our first stop, I think we both forgot that. I think so. <laughs> I don't recall ever recalling, oh, yeah, if I see something, I should make a sound. I probably would have freaked out and been like, grabbed you or something, or Jurassic Parked you and been like, turned your head. <laughs> but no, it was complete silence. And you turned you, you turned on your light, right? I turned on my light just to see if this what this was. It was just shadow casting or whatever, just my eyes. Um and we were there, yeah, about 15 minutes. And that's one of my first regrets is I think we should have spent at least an hour there doing like what we did, like at 15 minute intervals. Yeah. Uh, and then spend like even though, like the last like 25 minutes or 20 minutes just in complete silence waiting, maybe even stay longer there for another like hour just to see what would happen. But again, we were very much... uh alarmed and we stayed on the move <laughs> so i think that would be um that's a good idea for round two though mm-hmm. something knows that we went up there so if there's something up there we can stay longer and see if it wants to approach but i'm very interested to hear the recordings i wouldn't mind scrubbing through them myself if you send me the files there taylor but moving on from i was sitting in darkness after a little bit, I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do a couple of uh, bubble style calls. I, I had a pretty good one too. Like it was long winded. Mm, yeah. I felt proud about that. I don't know how you felt when I did that call. I, I thought, oh man, something, something absolutely hears this. Uh, like if my knocks didn't do the trick, this is because these are pretty good. Oh my goodness. And you did, you did different types too. You did like the quick, like whoops. And then you did those long ones. And I was just thinking, man, if I hear that from the distance, I get, we're ripping back down that road as fast as we can go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I'm glad I had the lung capacity to do those calls, but no, after that we waited a little bit longer and the shifting sounds of our of the car seats is what started to get me because like you could hear everything so just like the little of the vinyl rubbing against a sound like a knock to me i'm like okay it's it's too quiet there's nothing let's continue so we went back down to our second destination where there was like a little bridge and a river kind of flowed under it it's like a little stream and we thought we saw some depressions in the snow because we at a certain point we decided, oh, you know, we should also like keep an eye out for prints. We may not see anything, we may not hear anything, but we should keep our eye open to see if there's like any big footprints or like around the road or something like that. And it's dark, but with the headlights, you could see any depressions in the snow like that. But unfortunately, because of how tall the trees were, snow was clearly just falling off the trees and creating big divots in the ground all over the place. So it was very hard to see if there were any actual prints. Sometimes you could find like little animal tracks that were definitely not anything close to a human or bigfoot or anything like that just like deer tracks or something but we got back to that little bridge we checked out a couple depressions and then we kept driving and we got down to that logging area and at that point it started to kind of snow rain like it was very very light taylor got out i got out this was the furthest we walked from from the jeep so far out to a really thick tree 
Taylor grabbed a really big branch. Oh, I had huge. no cell service and I was like, I'm going to record this for my Snapchat story. And I'll just let it upload whenever we get back into cell service. Or, you know, if something happens to us, somehow my phone gets turned on, brought back to civilization. There's going to be a random Snapchat story after my funeral. But anyway, so Taylor does some knocks. I record it. It's complete, complete silence again. Just the loud echoing of knocks. Piles of wood all around us. It smelled really nice. I really love the smell of chopped wood. I think it brings back memories of me being like at my dad's work at the mill. So that smell of wood and logging stuff. So that was kind of nice. It was a little bit wet. Turn around and you walk back to the Jeep. It's just this foggy light in the snow rain that you can see. We sit in there for a little bit and we just listen again. And that was, I guess that was your next longer recording. That was my next longer one. Now, my regret here is I left the Jeep on while I was doing the knocks. And that was because we actually went further away from the Jeep. But I should I should have just turned it off the whole time while we we're there. I regret that. But yeah, the recording is much longer here because we were there for a little bit longer because it was much open to my left. It was very open. And to your right, it was, again, very open. And you have found a big tree, big log, and those knocks were hammering. You can hear the difference between these ones and the ones that we did at our previous stop. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm happy you left the lights on, by the way. That, that beacon of hope to run back to was the only thing keeping me going out there. If you turned off the Jeep, I probably, if something happened, I would have just ran off. Well, it's like it's dark enough. Like, thank God we both had flashlights, but it's dark enough that if you didn't have a flashlight, you're not seeing where you're going. And if the Jeep didn't have the lights on, you, you wouldn't even know it's there. It's, it's like you already alluded to this before. It's amazing how dark it was. And again, the moon, whether it's being blocked out by the tree canopies above, or it's just, it's cloudy too. Like we'll get into that. There was a nasty fog that came in and, and such, but, um, it was like silent hell at the end there. Yeah, kind of was. So, yeah, just that that was very crazy. And you touched upon this too, but those are the impressions as well. There was that one area where we saw those those slight impressions in the snow. We just kind of deduced that, oh, you know, maybe it's uh, it is probably the snow that fell down. But it was curious because it looked like something was obviously walking, and there were giant spaces in between whatever it was, and it was it, it looked like it walked. To into this little stream and then was gone. Now it could have been, could have been uh, footprints or it could have just been snow that fell down. I'm not sure. Like when we looked, it, yeah. it, it was, it's too hard to tell. I think it was, looked. I think it was snow depressions. Yeah. But I did have uh, my LIDAR scanner on my phone. Thank goodness that it's in 13 because that thing is a thing of beauty because we don't have any casting kits or anything like that. We'll give a quick explanation of how that works. So LiDAR technology is in most modern cell phones now, especially the iPhone Pro Maxes and in the iPhone 14 series. That allows you to basically put out a little invisible laser grid and it 3D scans your environment. It imprints things in actual size so you can pull up measurements, inches, centimeters, whatever you want. It'll import textures because you have to move your phone around an object like you're physically importing its entire model. And it'll grab the detail, all that good stuff, so you can look at it later. So if you saw something like a footprint, you could use your LiDAR scanner, you could scan it all, and you'd have a 3D model to look at on your computer, rotate, bend around, grab the diameter, the size, whatever. And it would also act as a photo of it, which is super neat. Yeah, very, very handy. Didn't even think about the whole uh, bringing the casting equipment, so I'm glad you brought that. You didn't bring, unfortunately, the Sierra sounds, which you made a point of saying we should just blast these on the Jeep speaker. And and oof. if there happened to be another human being out there, they would have soiled their pants. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which at one point we actually did. I I put my flashlight on. And we went right by like an abandoned RV, like just. One of those little overhanging units that goes over a truck just sitting there off in the ditch, covered in crud. It looked like it wasn't in use. That was a little creepy. Well, you wanted to go and check that out. And in retrospect, I should have allowed us because I was like, ah, just keep gassing along here. <laughs> well, what if there was a human being in there? What if they're like a murderer, some crazy person off in the woods? Well, then we get murdered. Yeah, no, don't just say that. 
<laughs> don't, don't just say, well, like, we got murdered. Well, let's hypothetically say someone is in there. We pulled over. We knocked. And it's a murderer. What do we do? Um, we don't know it's a murderer, though. Yeah, well, no, I'd be, we'd, we'd go prepared. We'd be sneaky. <laughs> I think I think a Bigfoot's more likely to kill us first before person in the RV. <laughs> That's fair. I would agree with that. Uh, well, I mean, after after we got to that second point, I mean, we were there for yeah longer period of time, 15 minutes. Uh, I was taking note of gas here because that's why we turned around at the 30 click marker because I thought, okay, let's we use this much half a tank to get out there. I want to make sure we have at least half a tank to get back. I don't want to get stuck out here without a jerry can, which again, retrospect future trips. I will throw a jerry can in there with gasoline. Oh, yeah, um, that, that's super smart. You also marked a couple of off-road, and I say off-road when we're already off the road, but more off-road than the off-road we're on. We marked a couple other little roads that kind of went up the mountain a bit. Mm -hmm. And on our way back down, after the um, log knocking, we went up another little trail there to see how high it would go. And this this is starting to get into to daylight now, so I don't know if there's more you want to add before we move on from here. Uh, one quick thing right before we got there, uh, the, I believe this is where the Menashe National Park was. And we turned down this road and we went to look and it was all gated off. There's no entry. Like they obviously did not want you going in the park. There was some like, I guess some old equipment nearby, but it, it was closed off. I don't know who's coming out this far to go to this national park, but again, it's gated. They didn't want people going in there. So, yeah. But so after after we checked out that, which was kind of suspicious, we talked about the different signs and stuff saying private property, no trespassing, do not enter, et cetera, et cetera, that we're just all over the place down there. Uh, we turned off and we went up the mountain a little ways. And there were some parts that were pretty, they were pretty thin. We, did, we weren't sure if the Jeep could go up there. So Taylor drove up as high as we could until the road was no longer wide enough for the Jeep. And there were some rocks that were in the way, which if we, if we just moved like these somehow rolled some of these boulders out of the way we might have been able to fit through and then continue up in the jeep but this is where we got out and we decided to walk up a bit and grab my headlamp and it honestly didn't feel like too long like it was total nighttime and 10 minutes of walking it was sunrise mm -hmm. that's what it felt like so we're going up this little winding trail there's lots of lots of elk poop and stuff like that can't even say deer poop it was way too big it was like elk poop or something so we're going up there uh we turn around a couple of creepy feelings nothing crazy and it started to get daylight and you could see sugar lake way off in the distance and i thought oh this is why i brought my fishing gear you know now it's kind of daylight i'm not really tired anymore i'm probably like in the overtired stage which is really when my eyes start playing tricks on me so i'm constantly seeing things that aren't there and i'm thinking i i just want i want to do some fishing have some morning fun and then we'll head home or whatever. And we're going down there. We go back to the Jeep. Now it's it's light enough by the time we get back to the Jeep. And I make this sound really short. That that walk wasn't the shortest thing. It wasn't long. It was just I think because the sun rose while we were walking, it made it feel longer than it really was. We got back to the Jeep. Didn't really need the the headlights on anymore. We went back down to the road. Totally different atmosphere. It was like all the quietness and everything just cleared right up. There's birds chirping. Uh, we found a toad, which we pulled over, took some photos of. Taylor almost ran over the toad. Yeah, that was like, oh, zipped around. You're probably wondering, like, what the heck is going on? Why did he stop? Yeah, he stopped. He's like, oh, Ruben, you got to look at this. I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, what is it? Is it like a, a like a dead animal? Something got torn apart and thrown in our way? No, I just get out and there's a, there's a big toad. It was pretty neat to see a frog that big. But um, after that, we went down there and we're like, okay, we'll pull over. We'll go to Sugar Lake. We found a little pull off point. We thought we'd do like, I have to pull up my fishing gear or something like that. But no, the whole lake is dried up. It was just winter killed completely. We're down there in the middle of the lake bed. Got some good photos. It was really nice to get the photos. Absolutely stunning. Really beautiful scenery. It's a really nice rocks there, but. I was kind of sad. That's the lake I used to go fishing in when I was a kid. And there's nothing there. There's no water. Now, way on the other side of the lake, it looked like there was still some ice and potentially water under that ice. 
So after we kind of walked around for a little bit, we were in the lake bed. We looked over to um, this one little outcropping. And it was so far away, but there was like a little black dot that was just standing upright. And we're like, oh, what is that? And I'm so tired. I'm looking at it and it's wobbling and moving. And Taylor looking at it and it's like it's wobbling and moving. So I pull out my phone. I use my zoom lens and I zoom in and it's just like a stick. Like we were just, we we're just so tired at that point. I was like, okay. So we go to the other side of the lake. Back towards the entrance of the lake, mind you. There's some buildings there. There's like a little campground. Or what used to be the campground. Doesn't look like there's any people there. The buildings don't look unkept, so I'm sure there's people there, at least for parts of the year. But we get there, and there's a little river going into the lake, and that there was a bit of water there, but there was no fish. I was sad. It was just completely dead. And it, it was down there that we decided, okay, well, we're going to grab our fishing gear. We're going to try going around to where there's some deep water on the other side, where the lake has... It's not dead. The ice is a little bit melted. It looks like there's a small pool of water. If there's any fish, if there's any hope of anything, it could be there. And I would have been happy just to cast my rod and just practice putting stuff together, taking it apart, because in the end, you know, the fishing trip, you don't need to catch any fish on to have fun. So we're going out there, we go down a little trail, and we get to a point where we're trying to get down to the water. And the snow is really deep. And it's like, it's the end of April. It's not super high elevation. But the snow, as we stepped over this one log, went up to my waist. And I was like, oh, well, I guess we're not going any further. And hmm. that's when you're kind of like, oh, we should turn around at this point. And I think it, it was also around this time, too, that you saw a truck come up to that kind of like a municipal campground building. Somebody came up with yeah. a truck, turn around. You thought they were going to like look at the jeep or tow it or something i don't know there's some irrational morning fear of not having oh, any sleep. It was. yeah total lack of sleep so we turn around and there's like a giant leg bone just sitting there on top of the snow now this is waist high snow and there's just a bone just perfectly on top of the snow untouched no footprints around it nothing a little bit of flesh on it doesn't look like it's human or anything like that granted i can't really tell my skeletons apart must have been like a deer or elk bone or something. But pretty big. Could have been carried yeah. there maybe like by like a bird or something. Maybe it was dropped. I don't know. But it was kind of creepy. I think that was the most eventful thing that we really witnessed on the whole trip. Besides the experience of hooting and hollering out in the woods. And we yep. made our way back up to the Jeep there. And I, we just kind of had fun chatting the whole time. Yeah, um, that was pretty much it. It just it didn't seem it seemed very peculiar how that bone was there. It didn't seem like it was placed there because yeah, no tracks or anything around. But going through that snow, that was deep snow. It was that was a fun time. Uh, well, thank God that we were prepared and we could handle it. But yeah, we went. We were trying so hard to get around to that portion of the lake that we could just, you know, you, I could see you cast a line out and maybe catch something. That would have been cool because yeah, the rain was starting to come down now. Uh, but once we turned around and we went back to the jeep, that's when we, well, a little bit of a drive to get home, and then we hit up a uh, breakfast joint, got some breakfast. So. It was all in all, it was a good experience. It was a good time. And I got to, I got to learn the things that I would change. So that's, I mean, if you're tempted to want to go out there and you want to do something like this, I would say like plan for what you would plan, like plan ahead for what you want to be doing. Like necessarily don't leave it to that second or third or fourth attempt, but like bring that extra gas if you need it. Bring uh, uh, a good stick or something like just <laughs> bring, bring these things. Bring a good stick. That's a good Bring one because it's really hard to find one in the moment, as we found out. Yeah, it really, really was. Um, you mentioned where we couldn't continue up that hill because there were too many other rocks with the toad and everything like that. When I looked at some satellite imagery for that road, if we continued all the way up, it goes to a very big clearing. And then that clearing has a like a person's trail, hiking trail, looks like that goes up even further out into the middle of nowhere. Hmm. That'd be a fun spot to kind of go, like daytime, daytime traveling. It, it would be, absolutely. And it looks like from all of the 
fecal matter on this trail, uh, this road that we climbed up there. It looks like, okay, this is exceptionally uh, frequented by a whole bunch of animals, it looks like, including which, toads. Which is a good sign, too, because if we're going to see anything, if there's wildlife around, it's a food source, right? Yeah, now, absolutely. I'll let you take over in a second here, Taylor, but considering this was our kind of first experience doing this kind of thing, we didn't get to see or hear much of anything at all. But if there was something out there, what would you consider that as a, as a terms of like a first contact kind of situation? How do you mean? I was looking at your notes and you have a little a little bit here that I don't want to take away from you. And you said, you wonder if it's like a first contact or if if something was up there. Maybe they would have just avoided us. Where the heck did I put that in my notes? Okay, this is such an unscripted episode. <laughs> We're trying desperately to go through our notes for once. <laughs> ah. uh, oh, so I wonder if this is a case of first contact. That that writing piece that I put in there? Yeah, I okay, thought that would okay. kind of fun just to bring up real gotcha, quick before we gotcha. end things. Because that's, that's a really good note to make. Yeah. Uh, so I had written, uh, I wonder if this is a case of first contact where and especially if anything was there. Were they possibly not staying anywhere near us so they could gauge what we we're up to? Uh, now, again, that is actually a massive assumption. So take that with a grain of salt. But I do actually wonder if we were to actually return to that location repeatedly, what might happen? So go, going there, like we did, I brought apples, but you didn't want to leave apples this time just in case you don't know what might happen. But if not saying we leave apples again in the future, but uh, if we were to revisit it consistently, then they get used to us. And then maybe finally that leads to uh, interaction of some remote kind. And I'm, I'm very, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I want to get into the gifting thing. That really depends. I want to know what uh, Sasquatch truly is before I attempt to do something like that. And if it came down to the nitty gritty of it, in an attempt to make peace, I would do it, but I wouldn't initiate it. If you That's know fair. I mean. That's fair. And you you can put other people's lives in danger. I mean, if someone else goes up there and they don't have an offering, they don't expect you to run into a Bigfoot. And Bigfoot's like, where are my apples? You know, <laughs> this, <laughs> this person's doomed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's an interesting spot, really. And I'm glad that we went out there. Um, I'm still interested in going over to the cusp, going to some other spots where there's reports. But... That was a good little start, and it, it was a good way to, to practice settling into that kind of nature because in the end, yes, this is a couple of crazy boys going out there hooting and hollering in the middle of the night just to see if they get a response from something. But it, mm. it's also a nice night drive with a lot of nature, very disconnected from technology, some really nice scenery. It's very quiet, mm -hmm. and I don't get a lot of quiet with tinnitus, so it was nice having this peace and serenity that was surrounding us even though it was dispersed through moments of dread and fear and then of course in the morning it was really nice and peaceful too that, that was quite nice i enjoyed that yeah uh you said it like getting out there getting our toes wet this is our first experience doing this and i think we were able to take away a lot learn a lot understand how we were feeling in certain situations even though nothing happened and i think that's very valuable and i have a lot that i've taken away from this experience with you not just enjoying the time with you to hang out and explore but being able to take that and apply it to our future round two trip whether it's to that area or it's to a new location like in the cusp area where lots of things are prominent I was, well, we were looking around for locations and Sugar Lake is what we ended up honing in on. There is one, and I pulled a BFR report of it where, and I'll, re I'll read it off here, but this is basically near Silverton. Uh, this is south of Nacusp. And uh, where is it here? Yes. So, uh, and I I'm quote, already looking at it. <laughs> you're already looking at it? Oh, Hell, gosh. I don't want to read it. I'm just like staring at it. <laughs> staring through your notes. Hmm. Uh, last night while on our way home, two members of our group noticed a peculiar sight and exclaimed, look, is that a bear? Uh, however, upon closer inspection, the individual seated in the front of the vehicle witnessed a large figure standing on two legs that eventually bent over and transitioned to four legs. Ugh. Meanwhile, the person in the back only saw the creature on all fours. Both parties confirmed that it did not resemble a bear. This event took place yesterday during the winter season, uh, year 2020, uh, when bears in the interior of the Kootenays are in hibernation. 
Living in close proximity to the sighting, all four of us decided to investigate and look for any tracks left behind. To our surprise, we discovered and captured on film several massive tracks that appeared to belong to a bipedal creature. Our home was located near, near Sil- Silverton in British Columbia, Canada. While exploring the nearby woods, I stumbled upon a tree structure that appeared to be deliberately arranged in a crisscross pattern. Additionally, on one particular evening, shortly after moving in, I had heard unusual deep resonating sounds that seemed to be part human, part animal. Uh, and one of the people felt a presence in the woods when we went back to look at the tracks. We felt like we were being watched as we examined and videoed the tracks. It just it was just past 9 p.m. when it was dark and snowy and there were low, no lights as we are in the wilderness. Oh. Yeah, so. that's, that's scary. I'd... It's one thing to say, you know, this is a terrifying experience. This is a lot of, there's a lot of moments here where we're out there and it's it's terrifying to be out there, but it takes a lot of bravery believing these things exist and going out to look for them. It's true. It really does. If now, you don't believe they exist, I feel like it's less scary. Oh you yeah. You've got, you got like a wall barrier. Yeah. But being, being a person that truly believes that Sasquatch are out there and you go out there looking for them. If we were to go out to that report that you just told me, we were to go out to that area, we're going to go to that exact spot and try to find that tree structure. Yeah, I'm going to be scared, but I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, you're a very brave person. Hopefully from the safety of a Jeep. Yeah. <laughs> just to defeat that thing you just said. Yeah. Uh, so that report is an extra three hours drive southeast from where we were at Sugar Lake. And of course... Maybe we will go check it out. Uh, My sister and her husband actually went out to Edgewood, which is under two hours away from Silverton. And it's basically like, yeah, Arrow Lake is up further north. I'm not sure what it transitions into, but it's basically on the left side of this lake. And then Silverton's on the right side, then the cusp side. And so when they were out inspecting some old farmland out there, very remote, that was for sale, they were very unnerved. They were telling me, Taylor, like the whole time we're out there from like the tree lines in the forest, it was eerie. We felt like we were being watched uh, and they did not go back to go and like pursue buying that property. It was very remote, very old farmland. Uh, and again, there is national parks and mountains all throughout near that area there. So you never know. Just to, uh, just to finish things off here, because I was... I loved the trip, but I was quite frustrated that we didn't get to go fishing. So the very next day, not the very next, sorry. Um, I went to work the next day. And then the next day after that, I had a day off from work because I, I normally have Tuesday, Wednesdays off. Mm-hmm. So we went fishing. We went way up the mountain, way up a mountain nearby. This was a lot closer than Sugar Lake. We went up to a little lake and I got to cast my rod. We saw some fish jumping. I, I didn't get a bite. Megan got a bite, but I didn't get anything. Saw another little frog that was kind of cool. And we accidentally fished way too long. It started to get dark really fast. (laughs) And on the way back to the journey, which is our our Dodge vehicle, on the way back to the car, I should say, not the journey. That sounds weird. On the way back to the car in the water, it didn't even occur to me to take pictures or anything. There was just a print that looked like barefoot. It was human size. So I don't think, I don't know, I couldn't have been, maybe it wasn't a Bigfoot, but I looked at it and they go, oh, who was out here in their bare feet? And it's super dark and it's scary. And I'm like, okay, we got to go back to the car. And I've just been thinking about that since the other day. That Very was a little interesting. scary. Very interesting. But I, I showed it to Megan and she looks at it and goes, oh, I kind of see that. And then we moved on because it was, there was no time. Mm-hmm. It was a long trip to get back down that mountain, but. There's stuff close by. There really, really is. And on that term, on the term of stuff that's close by, the Nicola Valley Bigfoot Conference is popping off. What a transition. (laughs) Yeah. May 13th, doors open at 8 a.m. Admission $30. Pruders for tickets are available. You can also, if they're available, you can get tickets at the door, but tickets are going pretty fast. So you want to pre order them ahead of time. Uh, we had Sheldon actually guest on Cryptic Clues a couple weeks ago. He is the host of the Nicola Valley Bigfoot podcast. Very, very nice guy. Go check out that episode. It is fantastic. He shared some of his own encounters and some of the stories and experiences with us and shared us a lot of information about the conference. Uh, 
Again, I'll have his email in the description below. You can reach out for any vendor inquiries, ticket inquiries, all that sort of stuff. Uh, there are some notable guest speakers from the Bigfoot community that'll be there during the day. Blaine McMillan, author of Wood Knockers and Tossed Rocks. Alex Solanak, cryptozoologist researcher. Leon Thompson, Sasquatch historian. Jason Zachristen, who's written Living with Sasquatch. And Judy Carroll, who's a Sasquatch communicator. Uh, this is the first time this is happening an event like this in British Columbia, and it's going to be in Merritt, uh, which is not far away from us, thankfully. So that's why, you know, we're making this happen. But uh, it's just going to be a good time. And it, it's not necessarily supposed to be this, uh, I don't want to say monetized, but this like flamboyant celebration of Bigfoot necessarily. But it's, as Sheldon puts it, and I love how he uh, deemed it a a safe space for individuals that have that one thing in common which is sasquatch they can come they can talk and just create that place where they're not alone where for the most part people you really do feel alone when you have these experiences so mm -hmm. just fantastic go check out his show go check out the conference it's gonna be a good time and with that i believe that's all for today so everybody thank you so much for listening to cryptid clues you can find us on our website, cryptoclues.ca. Send us an email if you'd like to get in contact, if you'd like to be on the show, if you have an encounter. If you have something you'd like us to talk about, just send us an email at cryptidclues at gmail.com. And beyond that, we're on pretty much all social media sites, and we even have a Patreon, patreon.com slash cryptidclues. If you support us there, you get some cool little benefits like a Discord and stuff like that. We're working on other things for the future. We do have some d, d episodes on there as well, which we might continue if we get some more subs. But beyond that, thank you so much for listening and have a good day. Bye-bye.